Hi friends, uh, welcome to welcome back to Coffee with Ravi. Uh, today we are uh, uh, very fortunate to have a, a guest, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, Dr. Ramesh uh, is the head of the hospitalist program at Allen. In addition to that, uh, he's a very wonderful, compassionate physician that I look up to. We're glad to have him here because he's willing to share with us uh, his experience with COVID. Uh, mostly focused on the inpatient setting, and I think we are, we are, it's, it's lucky because we are filtering thoughts of experience and what works and what doesn't work. So, welcome, uh, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, thank you for uh, being with us. I think the first thing that our patients would like to learn uh, is what are big lessons that we've learned uh, on the inpatient side of things with COVID. What are therapies that work? What didn't work? Um, and if you want us to, if you want to kind of share your collective experience with the hospitalist program, because I know Alan has done such a wonderful job taking care of patients in the community and being there for all of us. So, thank you, Ravi, for uh, inviting me. Um, you know, COVID um, took us by storm when it first started, and uh, there's a lot we didn't know when we first started. We were looking for. Uh, you know, new evidence and knowledge that came around th from throughout the world, really. Um, and we have learned a lot in the last one and a half years. Uh, obviously, there's still a lot of gaps in our knowledge. We still need to know more. Uh, some of the things that we um, have learned in the inpatient setting is, uh, number one, proning. Proning uh, it works really well in the inpatient setting, not just in the ICU, but also on the floor. So patients who are just on oxygen or high flow oxygen, we really encourage people to prone um, on the floor. So in proning bed. meaning having them lie on the yeah. belly. Yes, having them lie on their belly. Uh, evidence says up to 16 hours a day. That can be difficult. Most patients don't like to prone themselves 16 hours a day. I usually tell them to prone as much as they can. Um, so they can eat, they can do other things, and then they prone, take a break, um, and that seems to work really well. Obviously, in the ICU, uh, in patients who are on the ventilator, who have severe, what we call ARDS, the Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome from COVID, we do prone them. We prone them for uh, 16, sometimes up to 24 hours a day. And um, it, when it works, it really works like magic. You will see patients whose oxygen saturations are really low, and you flip them, have them on their belly, and uh, their oxygen levels just shoot up. Um, so that is one thing that has worked really well. Uh, from a medication standpoint, I would say steroids probably have the best uh, role in, in, in efficacy. Uh, so, so steroids are things like IV prednisone, IV uh, hydrocortisone, those are the, the groups that we use for anti-inflammation. Yeah, so in, in patients with COVID, the steroid which has been studied most has been dexamethasone, decadron. So that is our go-to steroid in the hospital. Sometimes we do use the other steroids, uh, solumedrol, prednisone as well, but mostly I would say it is uh, dexamethasone. Mm -hmm. um, and then remdesivir. Remdesivir is the third uh, medication, IV medication that we use. It is uh, an IV only medication and it's given for five days, which requires, and it requires monitoring of kidney and liver function. Um, so we do that as well. So the evidence is strongest for Decadron followed by Remdesivir. The other treatment modalities, there's not been a whole lot of evidence. You know, initially when COVID started, we started using hydroxychloroquine just because people were doing the same, but really we did not see a whole lot of improvement. And uh, subsequently we have stopped using uh, hydroxychloroquine. The same thing with plasma. Initially, you know, the thought was that plasma may work, uh, but then we did not see a whole lot of improvement with plasma, so we have stopped using convalescent plasma. Um, uh, uh, partly with the plasma, it could have been an issue with the timing. Uh, usually with COVID, what happens is patients are doing okay for the first seven to 10 days or so, and they experience uh, what we call the second week crash when they become hypoxic and that's when they come to the hospital and by that time plasma is, is already too late um, so the other medication which works really well doesn't we, we don't use it in the inpatient setting but it, it should be given is uh, the monoclonal antibodies 
uh, ban lanivimab, there's other monoclonal antibodies, Regeneron, they have a very high uh, efficacy. They work really well and it can be given only in the outpatient setting and it can be given uh, only when they're on room air, they're not yet on oxygen or they're still at their baseline oxygen levels. So um, Regeneron works really well in the outpatient setting. Um, actually, in my personal experience, I have not seen any patient who received Regeneron as an outpatient and then came as an inpatient. Um, we use the other vitamins also, um, vitamin C, vitamin D. Um, I don't think there's any strong recommendation for that really. It's one of those that, you know, it won't hurt a patient, so we just use the vitamins. But I would say the strongest um, evidence is for dexamethasone uh, followed by um, remdesivir. How about uh, in terms of patients that are getting admitted in the last six, eight months, any comments about vaccinated patients versus unvaccinated patients? Are you seeing any kind of, uh, for patients requiring hospital admission? That, it is a consistent pattern that we see. Uh, predominantly unvaccinated patients get admitted to the hospital. Uh, it, is, it is not common to see vaccinated people. We do see vaccinated people in the uh, hospital, sometimes in the ICU as well, but the vast majority of patients are unvaccinated. Um, and also the, the trend that we see is when we do see vaccinated people, they are not as sick um, compared to the unvaccinated people. The other sort of interesting change that we have seen in the last uh, eight months, one year is the demographics have changed. Um, when COVID first started, the most of our patients in the hospital setting were old um, with multiple comorbidities and not a whole lot of younger people. Now, actually in the last few months or so, I would say that vaccination has been uh, taken up enthusiastically by the elderly population. So unfortunately, we see more of the 40, 50 year old people now uh, in the hospital who are unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. And when patients are getting admitted with COVID, uh, typically the length of stays are longer in the hospital, right? You know, average is uh, at least a week to 10, 10 days, 20 days? Absolutely, yes. That is a, a, a big challenge which has been, uh, it has been quite challenging for all hospitals uh, everywhere in the country. The length of stay, as you said, is extremely high and especially if they, you know, deteriorate and go to the ICU, they can be in the hospital for up to a month or so. Um, so uh, anytime you have COVID patients, the, the, there is no turnover in the hospital because they, the length of stay is extremely high. So what could our patients and our friends and community members do as outpatients? Uh, what are things that, broad things that they can do to avoid getting hospitalized uh, with uh, COVID? So mm, I, I would say number one vaccine, number two vaccine, number three vaccine. Va vaccine is, uh, I would highly recommend the vaccine. Um, now, unfortunately, with the uh, development of variants and everything, we find that the vaccine may not be as efficacious as it was for the original variant, you know, when it was first tested, but they still offer a good level of protection. Now, um, we found that, for example, the Delta variant, the vaccine was not as efficacious as the first variant, but it still gave some protection. Now there's more and more evidence that people who have got the, the booster, it protects them um, much higher than the people who did not get the booster. So I would say that vaccine would be the, the top thing. Um, that's what I would strongly recommend. And people who are eligible for boosters, I, I think that they should get the booster as well. Yeah. Um, the, the earliest data in the world usually comes from Israel. Uh, Israel has uh, used only mRNA vaccines and um, they have a very high percentage of population who are vaccinated in Israel. And um, just today I was reading a report that, you know, they compared people who did not get the, the booster and the trends that happened once people got the booster, how the infection uh, rates actually went down. So vaccine would be the top thing that I would say. The other thing I would say is, you know, majority of the people with COVID, uh, with COVID who are hospitalized are those who have comorbidities. Morbid obesity, diabetes seems to be the, the top uh, reasons why uh, for morbidity and mortality when patients get hospitalized. Um, so 
we, we go back to the basics. I would say that, you know, exercising, eating well, sleeping well, weight loss, uh, those are really important because it's very unusual to find people with a, say, a normal BMI really have severe COVID. I mean, it, of course it can happen, but the vast majority of the patients, even the younger ones uh, who get really sick in the hospital, tend to have risk factors and morbid obesity seems to be a big one. Yeah. That plus the, I think, uh, to keep in mind that these antibody treatments are available if somebody is getting sicker, but not as sick to get into the hospital, I think to ask their physicians or healthcare providers, do I qualify for uh, antibody uh, infusion? Perhaps that's a little thing that could keep them out of the hospital if they're already COVID with COVID, but beginning to get sick, you know? Absolutely. I agree with you. I think there has to be more awareness of the uh, antibody, 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 antibody treatments. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the eligibility criteria is really broad, actually. Yeah. You know, majority of the patients uh, who have COVID will qualify for the region round treatments. And I believe that they are in the process of extending the emergency use authorization to even, uh, you know, teenagers as well. Um, the earlier it is given, the better it is. So ideally, it has to be given within 10 days of symptom onset, but the, the, it's most efficacious if it's given like within three days or so of the uh, uh, diagnosis of COVID. Um, so that is something that, you know, if even if people are having signs of uh, symptoms of a viral illness, they feel that they're not that sick, it is important to get tested for COVID, reach out to your primary care doctor, because they would they would probably order the region or treatments and that will keep you out of the hospital. Yeah. Lastly, I think our patients would uh, like to uh, see, uh, understand a little bit about the Omicron uh, variant. Uh, have you seen it uh, at uh, Waterloo or Blackhawk County? What are your thoughts on, um, uh, is it going to be as infectious or serious as the Delta, less so? What are you seeing in the literature? It is so new right now. Um, all we have is data from South Africa, which seems to suggest that it is more infectious than Delta, but we don't know if uh, we don't know about the severity. Um, the initial reports uh, tend to suggest that it is it is mild, but again, we don't we don't know. Um, and uh, the vaccine efficacy also those are questions that we don't know yet. Um, there are some some studies, and there were Pfizer released some data yesterday. Though it was very limited, it was a sample size of only about 30 or 40 or something, which seems to suggest that people who have the booster have some sort of uh, protection against the Omicron. Again, I, I think we are about you know maybe a few weeks to a month away from getting any sort of data on the Omicron. Uh, we go back to the basics of what we were doing. Um, you know, um, make sure that you are vaccinated, make sure you get the booster and follow the guidelines for masking uh, as recommended by CDC. Um, whether it will take over Delta or not, it's, it's too soon to say. One thing that people have to realize is more than 99% of all infections in the U.S. is from the Delta. It's not from Omicron. Um, it has not been detected in Iowa yet, but it is a matter of time. Um, these you know respiratory infections covid obviously it, it's really difficult to um, prevent the contagiousness spreading everywhere I, i'm sure it'll we will see some cases here uh, it is a matter of time but we just i think we are in a much better position now compared to when the pandemic first started we have learned so much uh, about covid um, in the last one and a half years we have vaccines, we have good treatments. So I think we are in a much better position. Uh, the only other uh, thing I forgot to mention about, uh, you know, inpatient treatments is the role of blood thinners. We do find a lot of patients in the inpatient setting have blood clots in their legs, blood clots in their lungs, even people with strokes, um, all from COVID. And we also use some blood thinners. Uh, not a high dose blood thinners. The data on this is, uh, is not you know, it's not entirely convincing yet what dose of blood thinners to use, but that is another thing, uh, thing we use to prevent complications of COVID. Yeah. So that's all. This is actually very informative to us and all of our patients. And uh, on behalf of our, myself and all our uh, colleagues here, I just want to thank Dr. Ramesh and 
his team of hospitalists. Uh, I've seen how hard it has been in the inpatient setting to take care of COVID patients because of the complexity and uh, newness and uh, 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 the uh, general sickness of uh, our patients. So they've really done a very st a tremendous job in our community. So I, I would like to really thank you uh, on everybody's behalf. So if there's questions on this, please email us or uh, uh, send us the information by uh, Facebook and we're glad to respond to you. I hope you got something out of this.